One of the arguments made by Paul Cornell in his article, Canonicity and Doctor Who, is that there can be no canon because there is no accepted authority that delineates canon. And while I agreed in my last video that there's no single authority on canon in Doctor Who, that doesn't mean I think there's no authority whatsoever. Authority on canon does exist, and I'm going to tell you what it is. This is the second part of my discussion on canon and Doctor Who. If you missed part one, I recommend you go back and watch it before proceeding with this video. If authority on canon does exist, where does it exist? Well, it exists on the printed page or on the television screen. Whenever a writer creates a universe, that writer has the power to make that universe whatever they wish. When they write a Doctor Who story, they always bring into it whatever past Doctor Who elements that they choose. They select a canon for their story. They have the authority to rule on matters of canonicity for their own composition. But by holding such power, we can't consider them bullies because the consumer chooses to engage with it. The consumer opts to allow the writer to transport them into their universe. And then they can leave it and move to another writer's story who may have a different canon. The writer also cannot be said to hoard power because any writer can do this. But to deny that the writer has the power to choose canon, as a canonicity suggests, is to deny reality. This is what Russell T. Davies said when he began to create the modern series of the show. Canon can't be defined by producers, but I do think the act of writing has power. So as a writer, I am saying now, the doctor I am writing is the same man who also fought the Dravins, the Macra, the Axons, the Weirin, the Terraleptals, the Borad, the Bannermen, and then the Master in San Francisco on New Year's Eve in 1999. One man, nine faces, still denying it, good luck. Right there, RTD establishes his canon, or at least alludes to it. Notice that he includes the TV movie. You may not wish to accept the TV movie as canon, but when you're in RTD's universe, you have no choice but to accept it because Russell is the writer. The writer has the power. You can't change what somebody else has written. Now, to avoid confusion, let me be clear. When I speak of the power of the writer, I am not referring to authorial intent, or at least not what most people mean when they say authorial intent. In other words, what a writer intended to convey in a Doctor Who story, what was going on in the writer's mind or personal life while writing it, what literary models the writer followed, what influences the writer had, etc., all are very interesting, but they aren't canon. Canon is what actually is put into writing or onto the screen. Yet the author's intent to continue an existing story, that does matter. It matters as much as a single author intending to continue their own story. Just as Return of the Jedi, say, ends the trilogy that begins with A New Hope, so Revolution of the Daleks continues the series that began with An Unearthly Child. Imagine you're at an improv class, and as an exercise, you're all asked to sit in a circle and create a story together. One of you begins, Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince with a wooden leg. Then the next person is asked to continue, uh, He lost his real leg in a fight with his cousin, over Coachella tickets. The next person says, his new leg he pulled off an old chair that someone had put out at the curb, and so on. Each person adds to the story, and this may or may not, usually not, go on the trajectory intended by the person who started the story. This, in a nutshell, is what Doctor Who does. But here's the thing. The improv only works when each person respects what has been said before, right? Their goal is to stay in continuity. You don't want to be a Michael Scott at improv. What each person states becomes canon for the people that follow. Or let's say you bought a novel, and it told an exciting adventure over 20-odd chapters. But each of those chapters was written by a different author. The book was written using the same method. Each author built upon what the previous author had written. Now I ask you, does that fact that this book was written by different authors mean that it is no longer a single story? Of course not. 
It's one story because it was the intention of each author to continue from what the previous authors had written. That is what TV Doctor Who has done. Any new story of Doctor Who bases itself on past Doctor Who. So whatever that writer chooses to be the accepted or understood background or standard for the story becomes that writer's canon. Would you ever say, well, I know that the Doctor Falls was intended to be a continuation of World Enough in Time, but I consider them to be two separate and unrelated works. No, I don't think you would. Would you do that for the Doctor Falls and the pilot? After all, one is the Heather setup and the other the Heather payoff. Or how about the Doctor Falls and Deep Breath? One is the beginning of the Missy story and the other is the end of it. Well, you know, it just keeps going. For the writers of TV Doctor Who, there is canon because they attempt to make new stories continuous with the old ones. They may not be 100% successful in doing so. Inconsistencies exist for sure. But the point is that they try. They have a canon that they work with. Now, because Doctor Who stories are still being written, most of the canons are in a constant state of flux. Even with the TV series, the canon changes with each and every story. For the episode, The Woman Who Fell to Earth, for example, the canon is all of the episodes from An Unearthly Child to Twice Upon a Time. But the canon for The Ghost Monument, the very next episode, is slightly different. It includes all the episodes from An Unearthly Child to The Woman Who Fell to Earth. Its canon, in other words, is one story longer. So while you can say that for The Woman Who Fell to Earth, An Unearthly Child is canon, you cannot say the opposite, that for an unearthly child, the woman who fell to earth is canon. Oh no, no. For an unearthly child, there was no canon yet established. And for the next episode, the Cave of Skulls, only an unearthly child was canon. That's how it works. Because canon is the foundation upon which mythology is constructed, you can only point backward to canon, not forward. Big Finish Audio has its canon, too. It includes the past television shows and past Big Finish stories. For novels, the past televised adventures also appear to be canon, but also other novels, though maybe not all of them. Whatever the case, there is no doubt that there is a different canon for the TV show than there is for, say, Big Finish. The makers of the TV program generally do not consult these alternate mediums when making their episodes, and they frequently contradict them. For the showrunner, the Big Finish stories are not canon. They are canon, however, for the Big Finish writers. Just as Catholics and Protestants have different canons of the Bible, so different producers of Doctor Who have different canons. There need not be any agreement nor any consensus among all the makers of various stories. There needs only to be a consensus among those who work in one particular subset of Doctor Who story creation. Now, some of you monocanonists might say, no, wait a minute, there is proof that the television series accepts the Big Finish stories as canon. In the mini-episode, Night of the Doctor, written by Stephen Moffat, the Eighth Doctor makes reference to his companions, Charlie, Chris, Lucy, Tamsin, and Molly, all from Big Finish audio productions. This automatically makes the Big Finish stories part of the TV canon. Wait, what? No. Only what is said or appears in a television story is television canon. So yeah, that the Eighth Doctor had those companions is now established as canon for the TV series. But that doesn't mean that every other story written featuring those companions is now canon. When the Doctor says in The Doctor Falls that the Cybermen developed on Marinus, which is a reference to a comic strip story from Doctor Who magazine called The World Shapers, should we take that to mean that all the comic book stories are now canon? Or even that the World Shapers comic strip story in full is now canon? The story in which Jamie dies? No. Remember, canon is what a writer will accept as the basis of Doctor Who doctrine for the story. Future TV writers will accept that Cybermen developed on Marinus because it was said in the TV program, but they're not going to consult all the comic books now to make sure their stories are in line with them just because Stephen Moffat wanted to throw in a reference to please the comic strip fans. What does all this mean for the consumer of Doctor Who? 
It all depends on the context. If you're watching an episode of Doctor Who on TV, you're in the world of one canon. But if you're listening to an audio adventure, you're in the realm of another canon. And if you're reading a Doctor Who novel, your canon has likely changed again. For this reason, it is possible for us to conclude that a story is non-canonical in one context and canonical in another. Which one of these canons is official? None of them, or all of them, whichever one you happen to be in. If I wanted, I could write a Doctor Who story which used only Dimensions in Time as its canon. I'd call it Dimensions in Time 2. And for me, only Dimensions in Time is true. What's stopping me? Nothing. So if you're reading my Dimensions in Time 2 story, guess what? You would have to accept and acknowledge my canon as authoritative. But as soon as you left it to watch or read something else, my canon disappears. In my third and final installment of my own canon trilogy, I will address the fans' approach to canon and ways to deal with canonical problems. If you'd like to be notified when it comes out, please hit subscribe. Thanks, and safe travels in time and space. <laughs>